Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never done. Welcome home, Brains. There's only one requirement to hang out on the edge, is that you open your big brain and close your small mind. Did you bring your thinking caps? It's time to put them on, because the conversation starts Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. This is the place, this is the address, this is the location where the conversation is pointed and the guests are sharp and the responses are what? They're never dull. So Paula, thank you so much for being here with me. Uh, Brains, our guest today is Paula Hartland and she's going to talk to us about, you know, being a coach, what that looks like in the parenting, okay? And we're going to go back and forth. Because we may have a lot of similarities, but then we may have differences. Are we into negotiating? Are we into reasoning? Are we into strong discipline? You know, uh, accountability, responsibility. What does that look like in 2022? It's not what it was in 2019 when your kids was going to school. Now they're staying at home. Uh, People are going through this uh, great resignation. We're still thawing out from COVID. What is the conversation that parents should be having with millennials so that we can all just get along? And she is an expert at that. She's been doing this for a long time. So, Brains, help me welcome her to the edge, Paula Hartland. Hi, baby. How are you? Hi. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, I love to talk you. parenting. I love to talk parenting because, again, it is so subjective. It's like art and music, you know, and everybody has a different style, but you have to... I don't know. Me and another person had a, a, a another conversation over the, the weekend about, you know, making your children weak versus making them strong, giving them, you know, a hand up, giving them a ha- hand out or handicapping them all together. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's really different. So tell me a little bit about your experience and how this particular genre found you. Well, um, actually, all the way back to when I was a kid, I was an actress. Mm. But I was also a latchkey kid, mm-hmm. and I was shut explain down. What, right, explain what latchkey kids, because they don't know what latchkey kids is. I know what it is. You know it. <laughs> well, I'm, I had a single mom. She worked hard. She was working hard, so I was on my own <clears throat> a lot. Excuse me. I'm gonna have to have some water one second. Okay. And <clears throat> I became what I call a tough girl who just handled everything. But what that did was it shut down my emotions. Any needs I had, any feelings I had, I just had to tough it out. But when I became an actress, because I was found by an agent, blah, 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 I started acting in parts where emotions just started erupting in me. And I was like, where do these come from? Where do these feelings come from? I didn't know I could feel angry. I didn't know I could cry. And then from there, I went on to explore emotional, um, all of my emotions. And eventually it led me into therapy. And it led me into really valuing how to both feel my feelings and how to communicate my feelings, honestly, openly, and vulnerably. And you know, it's pretty bizarre right now, but my throat is scratchy. <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. I'll go ahead. Take your time. Don't worry about it. Because um, you're saying a lot. And you know what? It's not just scratchiness, but I'm hearing a little bit of emotion coming, okay. coming through maybe that. that too. And, so. that's, and that's pure and that's authentic because yeah. it is a lot, you know, and to share, you know, what you went through and, you know, talk therapy or whatever kind of therapy it is, yeah. it's very important for people to understand that that's okay and that you need an outlet uh, and, but this is me. I want to outlet with some resolution. I don't want to be meeting on the meeting just to see what we're meeting about. I need some concrete results. So you took what you learned and now you have transposed this into a business well, model. Well, then I went into a lot of training for like five years. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've been, okay. I did a lot, a lot of training. And then I started a private practice and <clears throat> I've been teaching people how to feel their feelings. For over, mm-hmm. I said over 30 years, because, you know, a lot of people don't even know what they feel. And then when we get into parenting, 
our children bring up a lot of feelings in us that were not allowed necessarily, that were suppressed in different ways. Mm -hmm. So I help parents first recognize how to feel, how to know what they're feeling mm. so that they're able to respond to their kids' feelings or behavior mm -hmm, mm -hmm. rather than react and just react in ways that they were taught to react, how they were taught to react as kids. So, so in other words, you're trying to say that, that don't raise your children necessarily the way that you were raised. Some were raised with an iron fist. Some were raised super liberal. I had a, okay, I had an example uh, of a woman that um, was going to be a guest on my show. And she was an unschooler. Okay. She didn't believe in school. She didn't believe in wearing shoes. She didn't believe in, you know, combing their hair, all this kind of stuff. And I got it, but I didn't allow her on the show because of her vulgarity. Okay. See, uh, you know, I, I said something about, okay, well, I don't particularly like to swear on my show. And she goes, well, I don't like to be censored. <laughs> so you don't unrule me on my show. And I say all this to say this, without rules, there's chaos. Without rules, people are not able to migrate into mainstream society because no matter where you are, privileged, underprivileged, whatever, you're going to merge. Those two worlds are going to merge. And if yeah. you don't have some sort of tools, discipline, boundaries, understanding, negotiating skills, compassion, uh, you're going to grow up to be a narcissist and it's going to be a problem. And that's why I'm passionate today about helping parents have healthy communications with their children and negotiate with their children, not in a permissive way, but in what I call a win-win way, because it's the most valuable skill you can teach a child to be able to communicate authentically what they're feeling with respect and be able to listen to the other person with respect and be able to come to as we were saying before we started recording, hopefully a common ground. And that's an important skill for children to have growing up and, and go on into life and create business, create lives that are meaningful. We have to get along with everybody. And we have well, to- Well, you ought to get a job in uh, working for the government. <laughs> uh, what do you mean? Field. Yeah, you're in the wrong field of children. Where do you think, people lose that. Where do you think, okay, let, let's start. I'll tell you. I, can, I can tell you. <laughs> okay. You tell, no, no. well, oh, you tell ahead. me where they lose it. Tell me where they lose it. But then I want you to go back and tell me when should you start establishing it? Day one. Day one, we listen to the babies and all the way up from babyhood, all the way up through teens, bad behavior, what we call bad behavior is really the child trying to express something they need, but they don't know how to do it. Mm. And it's our job to first help them recognize what they feel. And that starts really at a very young age. Like when my daughter was three and she'd fall down, rather than rescue her, which would mean I had the power over her healing, mm. I would go, oh my gosh, you fell right there yes mommy I fell right there and Ellen you hurt your knee right there oh let me see yeah I fell and I hurt my knee oh wow and it hurts yeah it hurts okay I got it I'm with you, <laughs> I'm with you in your experience without me dominating you without me rescuing you without me abandoning you or any of that but I want to give you a story because my clients love stories. And this is when my daughter was 12. And this will give you a good example of how I like to parent and how I, what I do with other parents. When my daughter was 12, she wanted a belly ring. Mm. Now, I didn't want her to have a belly ring. But we had made a plan. It was Saturday morning. And she said, Mom, you told me we could talk about it. And I was tired. I just wanted to have my tea. And I, oh, God, I don't want to talk about this. But OK, now this is the style of parenting that, I'm, that I do, did and I support. OK, we sat on the sofa. I said, OK, Jenna, her name's Jenna, go ahead. 
tell me why you want a belly ring. She told me all the reasons and it came down to at the beach, all the other girls are gonna have one this summer and I won't. And I let her tell me everything about what it meant to her to have a belly ring. And then I said, can I tell you what I, my feelings are? She said, okay. I said, well, you know, I'm kind of concerned that that's sort of making you look sexy. And right. you're 12. And that, that concerns me because we've already talked about since when you were little, Mm -hmm. We were already talking about there are some people that are not so nice. So we got to be mindful of why you can't swim naked in the little pool in the front yard. You have to swim naked in the backyard. Right. So she, she listened to me. And then she and I said, plus your body. I said, you know, I don't know what it's going to do to your body. But this conversation took about an hour and we didn't resolve it. And we had to go somewhere. And we're in the car driving. And I'm tired from the, the conversation because it wasn't as simple as I'm explaining. Right. Oh, exactly. It never no. is. No. Not at 12 anyway. No. And so I turned the music on, trying to calm down. And then she turns and she, she says, Mom, do you think you're a good mom? Wow. And I said, no. And she said, you don't? And I said, well, considering I wish I could just throw you out the window right now, I don't think I'm a very good mom. Wow. <laughs> and she hey. laughed. That was, she knew the joke, and then then there's silence, and then she goes, "Well, I probably shouldn't say this, but Mr. Harris, my science teacher, said if you really want to win an argument and de in debate, when you, if you really want to debate someone, you've got to understand their point of view." And I don't think I should probably get a belly ring yet because my body hasn't finished growing. Mm. And I just sort of turned and looked out the window and went. <laughs> exactly <laughs> and then and then i said well that's a great point honey and then that was it no belly ring i had a situation with my daughter uh that uh she was about i don't know about seven or eight and i was driving her in the car and she turned around and she looked at me and she put her little hand on my leg and she says you know i listen to and watch every single thing you do i like almost put the brakes on the car and I asked her much like you did uh, I said am I a good example and she says yes you're a good girl <laughs> what that did for me was it gave me a heightened sense of awareness and just about how in tuned and engaged she was with me the situation the things that I do her learning and how she um, reciprocates that and pours that out into the world Parents, you are an example for your children. I don't care what you say. You think they don't know. I don't know why you're numb to it. Kids know more because they're listening and they're talking to their friends and they're having their own experience. Now, you know, it's a very different world now because uh, the millennials have a different way of thinking and communicating. Uh, they have a different way now of schooling. They are, uh, sexual orientation is really a bore to them. They don't want to be male, female. They want to be non-binary. They want to be called by a pronoun. They want to use Bitcoin. Everything has changed. So as parents, we have to evolve as well. You know, first they used to think that rock and roll was the devil. And, you know, interracial relationships were going to do something to you. And, you know, the haves and the have-nots. So changing your mind... Uh, parents, I think it's very important. Don't you think, Paula? Because we can't do oh, what yeah. we our, our kids are coming in smarter and wiser. And I have hope for our culture because they're coming in really smart. Mm -hmm. And they have a, and partly because of the um, internet and all the information that's on the internet, they have a really good bullshit meter. And they know, they can tell when someone is posing kind of an old word for them but you know oh, really? they, can, they can tell and i'll tell you something about what your i just want to say what, something about what your daughter said our children don't listen to our words very much mm -hmm. they listen to our energy they listen they watch to and they watch your actions yes yes and so we can say one thing but if we're not behind what we're saying for ourselves they know it they know it so, yeah. So when you have a child that is 
withdrawn, um, totally isolating themselves. Uh, they're shutting down. They don't want to engage with their friends. What are some of the ways that you tell parents to tap into that environment so that they can really kind of do some deep diving and find out what's going on? Uh, be patient. See if they will come to you. Don't push them. They might come to you to just sort of say something is going on. What, what I see parents do that kind of interferes, we don't want to interfere with our kids' experience. We want to welcome it and we want to be receptive to it. So we, we can say something like, you know, notice you're alone. You seem alone a lot. You're being alone a lot. Is, is that okay with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. All right. Well, just checking. Mm -hmm. But then maybe a day later, two days later, they might come forward and say, you know, I'm not so fine because so and so da 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 happened. They might come forward. This is my example of not picking my child up when she fell and rescuing her. It's the same here. It's like witness what our children are doing if they're withdrawn, if they're really pulled in and wonder what it's about, ask them about it, but ask it about, ask them in a way where they don't feel like they have to give us something to make us feel better. Hmm. Right. But and also in that, let me add to reassure them that it's a safe place. Yeah. You know, so, uh, sometimes children don't feel they're going to, come, you know, mom, I just smoked my first joint or mom, I just had sex yeah. or mom, I just, you know, whatever. Well, uh, this is where I start with the parents figuring out what am I really feeling about my child's behavior? Hmm. If I can figure, am I really, really frightened that I'm a bad mom right now? Am I not doing a good job? Am I am I going to have a really big problem and I don't know how to handle it? I need to know what my feelings are because my feelings are always going to be a little bit different than our child's feelings. Mm. So first, I think we need to check ourselves. Like, what am I afraid of that my child's withdrawn? Am I afraid they're doing drugs? Am I afraid they're, they've been abused? Am I afraid of something horrible? what am I really, really afraid of? And I need to figure that out before I attempt to try to help. So what is the benefit of doing that? I mean, okay, all I know is if I'm presented with a situation and I'll, I'm upset, I, you know, normally people are hit with a situation or a conversation and they're caught off guard. They don't have time to recoil and reset themselves. So this has to be a discipline. Uh, and a philosophy that they in incorporate in their relationship with their child so that they give themselves that space, that time to feel their feelings. Because yeah. you don't know how you're going to feel. I mean, you know, I've situations. <laughs> My daughter put the Barbie in the microwave, <laughs> caught a fire. After we told her a million times that you can't do what they do at the hair salon. <laughs> <laughs> and I was enraged because she could have set the whole house on fire. Mm -hmm. I felt fear, I felt angry. I felt uh, disrespected because it was a conversation we had had like at least 10 times. So all of these things. So you're asking a lot too of parents to compress and suppress your initial well, reaction until you can process it. Let me ask you, you had already had the conversation that if you put the Barbie in the microwave. Girl, you the oh God, right. The African-American at the black hair salon, they will put, synthetic hair, they'll put rollers on it, they'll dip it in the solution or whatever, put it in the microwave, curl it, and then do it okay. in the hair. Okay. And she just knew, and I told her 20 times, but I can do it. And, you know, so- Oh, that, she felt she could still do it even when you had said, no, that's I, dangerous. Exactly, and that's a, a lot like life. You know, don't take the car keys, don't do drugs, don't, you know, don't have sex, don't be on your cell phone. So all, your parents are taking in a lot. Yep. And yes. we have to, again, be the adults. But sometimes we can't be the adult in the room. Sometimes we're as big a kid, okay. if not our kids. Yes, yes. You yes. know? 
a lot of times we see we see that it does start really at a young age like when my daughter was doing something that was dangerous we i would stop and i'd say that is hot or that is dangerous and, and i said we don't want to get hurt and she early on knew oh i don't want to get hurt either so by the time we got we would get to do something like even with the belly ring you know it's like she didn't really want to hurt her body with the hair in the in the in the, in the microwave by the time we would get to that point i think we would just have to have already had a lot of conversations about danger Okay, so now let's jump into discipline. In this environment, what are ways to discipline? Because you've got to discipline your child as a learning, not you know, as corporal punishment. Even though I, I've you know tapped that ass one or two times, because uh, that's the only thing that got your attention, and I don't feel bad about it. I could count on one hand how many times I spanked my child, but they, she knew when I was playing, all I had to do was give her a look. I don't encourage that, parents. You know, so think what you want to. However, how do we do this? Putting them in the corner doesn't work. You know, what do we do as far as a form of discipline and letting them really know who's charged? Who is the parent versus who is the child? We start at a young age, age again saying, these are my needs as mom. I need this and this and this to happen for me to feel comfortable for me to feel good like my daughter would want to go to the store and get a pair of vans now i knew if we went to the mall she would get the guineas mm -hmm. so i'd say okay listen i think you're going to get the guineas and i don't want to go to the store and get and witness that so i just want to get you the vans no, mom, that's it. I'm, I'm, I only want the vans. First time we get to the store, mom, look at this dress. Oh, mom, wait, 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 wait. Mm. Oh, do you want that instead of the vans? No, I want both of them. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start walking back to the car mm. because that was our agreement. Okay, mom. And then that's all, of, you know, it's like communicating our needs and creating an agreement and holding to it. What, you, what, what you're describing in terms of discipline to me is called punishment. I'm punishing you for doing something I don't like. What well, happens- no, I, don't, with, I don't know, if, I don't know. Okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. Or, or I don't feel as good, or I think it's dangerous, whatever. It's, it's a form of controlling the child, right? Okay. Wait, 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 because I hold that thought, hold that thought. Because I'm thinking of it as more of a way of navigation and understanding risk versus rewards. And there is a consequence, not so much that I'm, you know, I'm not punishing you. You know, sometimes you will get punished. And I told my daughter, tell me the truth, no matter what, tell me the truth. You lie to me, you're going to get in trouble. But if you don't lie, if you tell me the truth, you're still going to get in trouble because just because you told the truth doesn't mean that you get a free pass there are consequences. So I understand what you're saying, but I wouldn't go as far as always punishing, but there would definitely be some discipline. There are always consequences. One of the consequences is I don't trust you now. But trust is contingent upon you doing something. Okay. Well, you know, Susie, if you call me every hour, I'll let you go out on a date. That it, that's not trust. That is, I will do something. It's a barter. I will do something an for agreement. something else. An agreement. I'm, I'm agreeing under okay. these circumstances because these circumstances make me feel okay. Okay. And I need to feel okay as the mom. I need to feel safe. I need to know. I need to be comfortable. I need to be happy. Right? So, these are the, these are the, we make agreements and then right, but that, that's not well. necessarily that the child is going to uh agree they will concede well, then, and say, then okay. have, well then we don't have an agreement and right then, okay but, this, but what i'm saying we I'm have sorry to interrupt but that's exactly the point i'm making if yeah you know, an agreement is among two people that's a negotiation right if they defy that right forget about my feelings what are you going to feel? 
Because you got to feel something to learn, you know, I don't mean pain, but emotion, risk, responsibility, fear. You've got to feel something for you to learn the lesson. Paula? Yeah, but kids want us to like them. They want us to be happy with them. They want us to be 100% on their side. And if my daughter does something or once upon a time did something that went against my my boundaries in some way, I stopped being happy with her. I stopped wanting to, I would tell her when she was little, jokingly, but somewhat since, um, honestly, I'm only supposed to give you three things, honey, food, shelter, and clothing. And everything else I give you, everything else, whether it be a toy, or my happiness, my playfulness comes from when I'm happy. So if you, you went and you went to that place and you did that thing that I, you told me you weren't going to do, I have stopped being happy with you and I've stopped wanting to give you anything else. And pulling yourself away and being unhappy with your kid it really doesn't make them feel good. They feel a natural consequence. We had, a, I had a stepdaughter for a while and she was younger than my daughter. And her mother told me, you can spank her if she's bad. And, and, and this is when she was about 12 or 13. And we were all in the kitchen with my daughter who's a little older. And, I, and I, we were teasing and I said, your mom told me I could spank you. And she said, no, she did. And Jenna said, my daughter said, well, oh, no, my mom does something worse. And, and my little, little friend was like, what? She, and she said, she stops playing with you. Mm. She just stops engaging with you. Because well, they want us to be with them and happy. They do. And they want us to like them and respect them and feel good about them. So when, okay. they, when they go so, so them, when they so when we do all of that to make them feel a certain way about us that is when the bridge between parenting and you know a ch parent and child come together that is where they meet the rubber with the road yeah I mean it's a relationship like we have with anyone and let me ask another question you said start in an early age Sometimes you don't recognize a sign or symptoms until they've turned into this little greeny meanie at eight years old or 10 years old, or they become defiant at 16. Sometimes you don't have an opportunity to start from the ground up. Sometimes you have stepchildren That's that come true. into the family or, uh, you know, children of divorce. H how do you start? Because at that point, in all honesty, they don't care if you play with them or not. They really don't want to be bothered with you. They still want to be liked. I've okay. worked with divorced families and divorced kids. And a 13-year-old daughter who's mad at her dad because he left the family and went on and had another relationship and says she doesn't ever want to see him again. She doesn't really mean it and she really wants him to like her. She needs to have it be proven to her that he didn't leave her and he wants her. Oh. Our kids want us. They want the, they want the connection. And a lot of times, you know, I, I say this to parents that are re, uh, remarrying or blending a family. That is very, very difficult. I always speak for stepchildren. I can speak, you know, from experience. Uh, so blending a family, there has to be a lot of communication. Uh, not only with talking to the children, but talking to one another and your spouse to make sure that you're on the same page because you're going to have some influence. Uh, maybe you have an amicable relationship or maybe you have one that's very volatile with the other spouse. But these children, too, want to know who's on my team, who cares about me. Yeah. You have to have those conversations, but don't just give in uh, just for the hell of it. And, you know, try to buy their affection, try to buy their love, listen to them and try to build a bona fide relationship. Because what happens is say you and that person breaks up, 
You've built a bond with that child, and now not only has their father let them down, their mother let them down, but now the new people that they've allowed in their life let them down. And so they start building all of this resistance and anxiety. I know, you know, gang members that have had great families, but they didn't feel that because of all of this other stuff. And they turned to gangs where they had stability, uh, they had loyalty. Mm -hmm. They were respected and honored. They felt like they had courage. So you always have to build it up. You can't just expect to go in there like a, a bulldozer and knock things down. You have to meet people where they are, and that includes young adults. Yes. Wouldn't you agree? I totally, totally. It's a, a real a relationship it takes two willing people to work it out and two people willing to listen to each other mm -hmm. and, and show caring. And it's the same when they're babies all the way up to when they're adults. I have an adult child now. Absolutely. Well, you are, have been an amazing guest, and I've loved having this conversation with you because, again, there's a lot of things that I'm glad about, and one is not having no young person to raise. <laughs> <laughs> but I love children. I love to have a conversation with them because they're little people. Don't underestimate them. Don't overthink them. They will tell you everything you want to know if you listen. Uh, spend time with them outside, recreational, show them how to cook, talk about the good old days, take away the device, you know, all of those things are very helpful. And connect with people like Paula Hartland, right there, Grace. Okay, right there. Got going the wrong way. Uh, connect with her because she knows, and again, your temperament and your vibe is just so easygoing, you're... Yeah, you're you're soft, you're relaxing, you know how to negotiate and come to an agreement. So tell my brains how to get in contact with you so they can uh, do some work with you. Well, thank you. Well, you can you can go to my website. It's Paula Hartland and it's spelled like the Hartland, H-E-A-R-T-L-A-N-D, Paula Hartland. And they can see more on my website and connect with me there. And I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk to me. Yeah. Well, Talk to her brains and talk to us here on The Edge. Go back and listen to other edgy conversations. I need you to love, like, and subscribe. What did I say? Love, like, and subscribe. One more time. Love, like, and subscribe here <laughs> on The Edge. And share, 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 because sharing is caring. And thank you for caring, Paula Hartman. Thank you. Right. Thank you, April. Okay. Right. Bye, Bye, brains. Bye.